So Oz is a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Western Ontario. And he's also director of the Institute of Earth and Space Exploration at Western. Um, most importantly, he's a graduate from the University of St. Andrews, like all good people, including myself and Jim. Um, and he got his PhD from the University of New Brunswick. Um, Oz's research interests are diverse and interdisciplinary in nature, and he focuses on understanding the evolution of the surface of the Earth and other planetary bodies, as well as the origin and evolution of life, which is quite a lot of things. Um, but his main focus is on understanding impact craters as a planetary geological processes on both Earth, Mars and the Moon. And he's conducted fieldwork in lots of very exciting sounding places, including Antarctica and in the Canadian Arctic, where most of his work is based. He's received numerous awards for his research, including most recently the 2021 Beringer Medal from the Meteoritical Society. He's also involved in the ExoMars mission to Mars. And I think the most cool fact was that he provides geology training to Canadian and US astronauts. So I'm really looking forward to your talk, Oz, and thanks for agreeing to be part of our seminar series. All right, well, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation originally, Catherine, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So, yeah, um, let's begin. So when I was an undergrad over your side of the pond in St. Andrews, as Catherine said, um, you know, I think I remember maybe a couple of lectures where impact events and impact craters were even mentioned. And I think one of those was only one option for the origin of the Sudbury impact structure here in Canada. And so, you know, that was 20 plus years ago now. And I think, you know, as a community, we've come a long way. And I, I hope it's safe to say that, you know, there's growing recognition or increased recognition that impact cratering is a fundamental geological process that shape the surfaces of, you know, not just the earth, but all objects with a solid surface throughout the solar system. And what I'll focus more on today is that they may have played a fundamental role in the origin and subsequent evolution of life on earth. And, you know, that makes them important to uh, think about for understanding when we're going to Mars with ExoMars, for example, to look for evidence for past life there. Okay, I would like to just say a special thanks to three people. Um, and I'll come back to this at the very end uh, with whom this talk wouldn't be possible. So Charlie Kakel, who is a professor up at the University of Edinburgh, a microbiologist, and two of my former students, Alex Pontefract and Haley Sapers. So to set the scene, you know, when you look out there in the solar system, um, you know, if you Google solar system, you'll come up with tons of different versions. I particularly like this one because it shows, um, you know, that the solar system is, is not empty. Um, we have, you know, the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, and they've quite nicely drawn a comet uh, coming in here. And so again, um, this recognition that impact events, you know, played a, the cratering rates were very much higher than they were uh, than they in the first half a billion years of solar system evolution than they are today. But still, you know, objects are hitting the Earth every every second of every day. Typically, dust-sized particles, but every now and again, larger objects uh, come and strike the Earth's atmosphere. The moon is a witness plate to this. You know, there's a lot of excitement about returning to the moon. Um, and, you know, amongst the, and that's why I've been involved in training the astronauts, actually, because when you look at the moon, you've got two main geological processes, volcanism and impact cratering. And even on a clear night, you know, it was a full moon recently. Uh, you don't even need a telescope to be able to look up and see a lot of these kind of the dark splotches or these old basins, um, some of them thousands of kilometers across that were filled with lavas after they formed. And then these brighter um, kind of circles, famous Tycho crater, you know, sent out rays and debris for thousands of kilometers from its uh, point of impact. So, you know, when you look at Earth, you can begin for thinking, you know, what, why should I study impact cratering? Is it important? Um, well, you know, it's very deceiving, in, in particular this view, probably more than others. Um, this is one of the first views of Earth taken by the Apollo astronauts, you know, 50 years ago. And you'd be hard pushed uh, to know, unless you know your uh, African impact crater geography very well. Um, you know, there are a few, quite a few craters in Africa, but none that are really visible from space. Um, but we do know now um, of 200 craters plus or minus one or two, depending on who you talk to here on Earth. 
this is a this audience will probably be able to guess why there's a concentration in North America, kind of Scandinavia and Australia. Um, but uh, you know we can come back to, uh, come back to that at the end if you haven't uh, figured that out. Um, one of the things that well I came to Canada um, well 25 years ago now um, to do my PhD and there was a, to work on this particular crater in the Canadian Arctic and I'll be um, focusing on this one quite a bit. But you'll see there's a large uh, you know, crater population here in Canada, about 30 craters. And again, for me as a, a field geologist still um, for my foundations in St. Andrews, I've been able to get into the field to some of these you know, very remote places that haven't been studied much is a big, um, big part of my research. If you're interested in learning a bit more um, after the talk, you can go to impactearth.com. That is kind of a out dual outreach and uh, research site that I've been working on for a number of years now. And there's a kind of up-to-date map where you just click on go to map on the homepage and you can kind of browse all of the confirmed uh, impact craters we have here on Earth. They're also on social media, just to back up um, impact and saw craters. And uh, I probably mentioned that it was on the title slide. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me after the fact via Twitter, um, I'm Dr. Crater. So uh, look me up. So, you know, if I was to quiz most of you, uh, you know, general public, I use one of the same slides, you know, what's the first thing that you think about um, where if I was to say, you know, impact crater, impact event, well, it's probably not a positive one, right? You know, imagine an asteroid a kilometer across uh, hurling towards Portsmouth at 20 kilometers a second. It's not going to be a good day for you. Uh, and it wasn't a good day, you know, for the dinosaurs and about 65% of other species on Earth um, 66 million years ago. Um, this is kind of a, a, an old plot now from Bevan French's book, Traces of Catastrophe, but it kind of places impact events into context in terms of their energy with respect, you know, to some other phenomenon. And so if you've ever made it over to, um, you know, Grand Canyon land in northern Arizona, um, it's a you know, fantastic place for geology. Of course, you've got the Grand Canyon there. But you also have Meteor Crater just outside Flagstaff, which is one of the best preserved, you know, small craters on Earth at just over 1.2 kilometers across. And the energy released by that event is, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude more uh, powerful than the atomic weapons dropped on Japan at the end of the Second World War. And, you know, it's still an order of magnitude more powerful than your typical Cold War era uh, hydrogen bomb. We then have things like Mount St. Helens, you know, earthquakes, and then we get to the craters that I'll talk about, Horton. You know, Chicxulub down here is starting, it's getting off the scale here. You know, we're looking at 10 to the 7 um, megatons of TNT equivalent. It doesn't mean much to me, and I've been studying this for a long time, but, you know, a huge amount of energy deposited. And the difference between this, you know, process and other geological processes is, deposited at you know, a single point in the Earth's crust and in a very short period of time. A typical crater, you know, even Chicxulub, probably would have taken <clears throat> less than five minutes to form. So from the point of impact to the final crater, 200 kilometers across, being nicely kind of settled, five minutes. You know, so the, the strain rates are huge, the time spans are small. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's also a challenge because, uh, you know, unlike volcanism and things that you can go and look at happening in real time and, uh, and things, we thankfully haven't had an impact event um, in the recent past. So we're studying, you know, the geological record uh, primarily. And so throughout, you know, the past uh, few decades now, these are some older papers, I don't have the year on here, but kind of in the 80s and 90s, the recognition that impacts were destructive kind of led to this idea that, you know, we've got the impact frustration for the origin of life, the annihilation of ecosystems by large asteroid impacts on the early Earth, you know, some very well cited um, papers and basically uh, to do with this kind of plot at the bottom too. Um, of course, this could be a whole other talk on its own. And, you know, James does some work and quite a lot of other folks um, around the world on, you know, on what was the cratering rate in the first, well, not just half a billion years now, let's say a billion years. Um, you know, we used to think it was an early intense bombardment. And then we talked about the lunar cataclysm around 
3.8 to 4 billion years. Um, that may not have happened. There's this idea of a sawtooth now um, or kind of zigzag type decline. Um, but whatever was the, the case, there was still uh, higher rates of impact events in that first half a billion years of Earth's history. And, you know, if you kind of Google uh, Hadean Earth, um, of course, we weren't there. Uh, we don't really know exactly what it looked like. But on the right hand side is, you know, an artist's rendition of what this first, you know, five, six, seven hundred million years of Earth would have looked like. You've got, you know, volcanoes erupting and a whole bunch of things coming through the atmosphere and colliding with the Earth. So this is a bit of an enigma because it's also at this same time, um, at least 3.8. And, you know, a bunch of papers in the last few years have proposed that they found evidence for life going back to 4.1, even 4.2 billion years for some old rocks around Hudson's Bay in Canada. And so, again, we know from this time that cratering rates were much higher. And from Luna, from studying the moon, we know that this is 10 or 20 times higher cratering rates than today. So, you know, back when I started my PhD, you know, I, I kind of asked myself, and I'm sure a lot of people did, you know, if, if cratering rates were so much higher then, um, you know, how and, and why did life arise at this most inhospitable time in Earth's history? Uh, so I think there's a, I don't know if, I'm, uh, there may have been a hand up there, but it's a bit hard for me to keep track of, uh, of everyone's videos. So um, if we can leave questions to the end, I think that might be, might be easier. Um, okay, so the hypothesis that I want to present to you today is that um, impact craters can generate conditions suitable for the emergence of life through this uh, production of substrates, uh, the delivery of life essential elements, and through the production of habitats for microbial life. And I'm going to kind of start at the bottom and work up. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover this in, uh, in a ton of detail given the, the length of the seminar, but I'll touch on a few key things and a few key of the, uh, the aspects that uh, myself and my group have been working on over the last uh, kind of couple of decades. So habitats, what do I mean by this? Well, so this is a habitat for microbial life. And the key thing here is that these uh, habitats only exist today because there was an impact crater. So they didn't exist before there was an impact event and they were in fact created by the impact event. So we'll start with uh, hydrothermal systems. I'm sure you're all uh, either familiar with, or if you're first year uh, about to be familiar in the next year, you know, with hydrothermal processes, important for ore, form ore deposit formation and a ton of other things. So, you know, why we're interested in hydrothermal uh, activity or why I am today and why I'm talking about it is that if you go to Yellowstone uh, National Park, there's a, which is this picture here, you know, we've got hot springs and things at well above 100 degrees Celsius, um, but life is thriving in them. We have these thermophilic, so heat loving organisms. And of course, we still think that hydrothermal systems are one of the, the prime candidates for where life originated on Earth. So on Earth today, of course, uh, I won't put the image back up, you know, most of the active systems, if you think of Yellowstone, New Zealand, Iceland, these hydrothermal systems are driven by volcanic magmatic heat. And, you know, the word hydrothermal comes from two Greek words, you know, heat plus water. And that's really all you need to generate a hydrothermal system. Uh, this is an old paper now. It's a bit out of date from 2002. But kind of the colored in uh, circles here are at that time craters where people had documented uh, hydrothermal activity. Um, the white circles are where people haven't. But I would note that many of these are, you know, in Siberia uh, or they're just not exposed and are uh, well studied and so the number is much higher uh, today. All the red dots are places that uh, you know, I've worked on and uh, looked at evidence for hydrothermal alteration, um, but we'll just really focus on the one today as a bit of a case study. So I'm gonna take you up to um, the Canadian high Arctic. Uh, this is where I've spent um, you know, a good 20, 20 or so summers. I came, I still remember vividly coming from, uh, you know, the UK, spending time in Scotland with no trees, landing in New Brunswick here, more trees than I'd ever seen in the world. And then uh, the screen shot behind me is, is actually from the Horton Impact Crater. So it lies in a polar desert environment, uh, which makes it, you know, just fantastic for doing geology. So quickly, you're looking at a Landsat uh, image. Um, the crater here is about uh, 23 kilometers across, kind of stretches from here 
to here. Um, the pale gray materials in the center are rocks that were molten by the impact event. So the energy of an impact can vaporize and melt huge volumes of rock. And so that's one of the major heat sources for these hydrothermal systems. As a quick aside, uh, it wasn't important for Horton, um, but rocks can also be brought uh, from depth in these so-called complex craters in the very center of the crater here. Um, typically something like 110 or 1 20th of the diameter of the crater. <clears throat> so for Horton, you're only bringing rocks uh, from a couple of kilometers down, so not very hot. Uh, but if we came to Sudbury, um, 200 kilometer across crater, the rocks that were brought to the surface instantly um, by the impact event came from about 20 kilometers down. And so, you know, based on the geothermal gradient, that's another uh, substantial input to these hydrothermal systems. So this is what it looks like on the ground, you know, just a fantastic place to do field work. Um, just a couple of fun shots, you know, it is a, this is, this was Canada Day, which is July 1st. It's kind of Canada's Independence Day, and so, but this could be Scotland too. I'm not sure I've had snow in July, but definitely in, in June in Scotland. And so, you know, not, not dissimilar in that respect, but of course, uh, we don't have these in, uh, in the UK. And so you've got to uh, keep on your toes and uh, keep out for the wildlife that uh, we still have in, uh, in this part of the Canadian Arctic. And that was a picture I took after this bear trashed one of our tents uh, in 2016, one of my last uh, trips up there. Okay, so back to the geology. Um, if you picture that uh, satellite image in your head, um, this is a, a very simplified geological map of the crater. So the, um, the orange material here, are again, these impact uh, melt rocks in the center and the kind of the purpley color are rocks that were uplifted by the impact. All the black lines are faults, um, some post-impact crater lake sediments that aren't really too important for this story. But what I really want to draw your attention to is all of these little uh, red symbols. There are stars and circles in here, and you can see that these are not randomly distributed. Um, these uh, circular structures, I'll show some pictures in a second. We think these are fossil hydrothermal vent structures, and you'll see that they're concentrated around the crater rim. And we think that makes sense because that's where you have all of these faults acting as conduits for these, uh, uh, what would have been likely uh, hot springs, geysers, steam vents on the surface. And then the stars are um, kind of bugs and veins within the, these uh, melt rocks that I'll show uh, right now. So, you know, what's the evidence? Um, there's a rock hammer there for scale. This is one of the larger vugs. So this is, you know, this would have been a big cavity. We would have had fluids coming up, circulating through here, coming to the surface. Um, and as those, temp as those fluids cooled, they precipitated in this case, um, a lot of carbonates, uh, fluorite, some sulfates, and then kind of the sparkly green material is marcosite, which is iron sulfide. It's essentially a polymorph of pyrite. If there are any planetary folks in the room, um, this white kind of yellowy material here is actually jarosite, which is an interesting weathering product at Horton, um, but caused a lot of interest when it was recognized on Mars probably a decade or so now by the Mir rovers because it's a hydrated mineral, you know, so you need water in the environment to form this. Um, we also see big, massive, um, not as big as the, you know, the crystal cave in uh, Mexico, but this is selenite, so the transparent variety of gypsum, and, you know, some pretty massive crystals here. And these gray rocks all around, again, are these impact melt rocks. Um, of course, another kind of key ingredient for, uh, you know, a hydrothermal system is having pathways for the fluids to flow. And, you know, I haven't really gone into the impact cratering process here. You know, it's very energetic, very powerful, and you fracture and fault, you know, huge volumes of rock. And so that also makes them good environments for, um, for hydrothermal fluids, lots of fractures and faults for fluids to pass through. Um, as a quick aside, it actually makes some good hydrocarbon reservoirs. Um, there's some prolific oil and gas producers in, uh, here in North America that are formed in, uh, that are there just in the bullseye of, uh, of the impact craters. But what you're looking at here is, is calcite. Uh, there's kind of a vein surface in the plane of the screen, and then another one coming in almost at right angles too. And then these are not perhaps the most interesting to look at in the field, um, but this kind of two yellow, orangey yellow uh, stains here, 
like uh, what we mapped as pipe structures originally, and that you know the paleo surface would have been just above this image. There's not been too much erosion. I should have said that you know Horton is relatively young geologically, at about 23 million years old, and it's been in you know pretty much a polar desert environment since then. So maybe 100 meters or so uh, of erosion, um, but you could picture fluids coming up here and uh, coming to the surface. And so based really primarily on the work at Horton because we can do field work and it's uh, still the biggest crater where we have an accurate geological map that was the product of my PhD, plus uh, drill cores from other craters. Uh, I kind of put together the schematic diagram of where you might expect hydrothermal deposits um, and the different settings for hydrothermal activity within an impact crater. So in these hot uplifted rocks, kind of both on the inside and around the edge of the central uplift, um, kind of Cree for astrobiology and geobiology are hot springs around the crater rim. Um, and what were actually a more recent discovery, and I've got a student working on the Reese crater in Germany that uh, I think you guys may do a field trip there. Um, but if you get an opportunity, uh, the Reese impact structure in Bavaria is actually a similar size to Horton not as well exposed, but you have some great quarries and some drill core. And I've got a student there at the Reese. The Crater Lake seemed to have fallen very quickly after the impact event. And there's evidence for hydrothermal venting into the base of the lake um, over, you know, tens of thousands of years. And, you know, so just picture, you know, not black smokers at the bottom of the ocean floor, but hydrothermal vents coming into this Crater Lake environment. And so, you know, a really excellent uh, environment for, for organisms to, in that case, recolonize the reefs, but on early earth, you know, potentially a setting where life originated. And I've kind of hinted at this earlier, um, you know, why the interest, this is looking a bit blurry on my screen too, so I apologize for that. Um, but this is kind of a version of the terrestrial tree of life, you know, the three domains of life, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. And, you know, the, there is, of course, controver some controversy about this and some debate about, you know, a cooler origin of life now. Um, but I still think uh, a large part of the community favors the idea that hydrothermal systems were where life originated. And the reason is that they're color coded here. So the oldest kind of um, life that we know um, are what we call thermophilic. And if you can't read this, this says maximum growth temperature and red is over 90 degrees Celsius. So, you know, we wouldn't be too happy in that environment, but all these organisms in these hot springs and things that, that you would see at Yellowstone are. And take home message here is that, you know, of course we have volcanism still to generate hydrothermal systems on early earth, but on early earth um, and other planets, even that weren't big enough to have volcanic activity, you're gonna have impacts. And if you've got any H2O around, even in the frozen form, let's say in present day, day Mars, that ice could be melted uh, to create, you know, potentially if we had a big enough impact on present day Mars, a hydrothermal system at the present day. Okay, quick time check. Um, gonna now look at a couple of other habitats. Um, so the other one is impact process crystalline rocks. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So again, impacts are very energetic. You can vaporize and melt a large volume of material, but kind of below that melting point, you will shock metamorphose. So if you're teaching learning metamorphic geology um, these days, you know, shock metamorphism, metamorphism is a class of uh, metamorphism that is essentially high pressure and high temperature. And uh, what we have here, um, hopefully you can see on the bottom right, this is a, a fragment of the Canadian Shield, three point billion year old nice that is broken on a fresh surface, you're looking towards you. And there's a layer of pink and a layer of green here. And so these are what we call endoliths, endo, you know, within, lith, rock. Uh, so endoliths were first discovered in uh, the dry valleys of Antarctica in the 1970s, and essentially in sandstones. You know, so organisms are living in that habitat within the rock because it helps um, uh, uh, go against the temp big temperature fluctuations. The uh, rock traps moisture. And important for these polar environments on Earth and also Mars is that they're high, U uh, high UV radiation. So the rock and the minerals are actually, you know, 
providing some uh, UV, some sunscreen essentially to the, those organisms. Okay, why the excitement at Horton? Well, um, you find endoliths typically in sedimentary rocks where there's enough pore space for organisms to get in there and enough translucency from light to make it into the rock. So again, this is a, a lump of uh, nice that's uh, never been, never found, uh, has never had uh, endolithic organisms found within it. So to show you a little bit uh, about what's going on here, this is from a paper um, by one of my former PhD students, Alex Pontefract. Uh, she took um, fragments of these nices, uh, shot to various different levels. So essentially, you know, zero is unshocked and seven is very highly shocked and about to be melted. And she sterilized those rocks and then basically grew, you know, uh, tried to grow organisms on them. And you'll see, you know, it's not a, not a straight line, but a fairly good increase in the number of cells per gram um, from something that was unshocked to uh, highly shocked. And if you look at the rocks themselves, you know, many of you are geologists, uh, this is a backscattered electron image, so grayscale. Uh, each of these are about a couple of millimeters across field of view. You know, that's what a nice should look like. Uh, very little porosity, you know, very tiny little fractures, but you've got different minerals here uh, being locked together. As you come up to kind of medium shock levels, let's call it, you've introduced a lot of fractures. Uh, some of the materials are starting to transform to glass. And then when you get up to the high shock pressures, um, these rocks are basically like pumice. You know, if you've seen volcanic pumice, um, I've actually got a, a fragment of, of, again, three billion year old gneiss that will float in water. It's so porous. And so this is what an impact event will do to rocks that were initially not colonizable and that's made created habitats um, solely strictly through to the impact process. So, you know, it's a neat finding from Horton, um, but why this is important is that, you know, if you look at basaltic worlds, which most of the objects in the solar system are, you know, Basalt has some porosity if it's uh, vesicular, um, but you know you can impact uh, these rocks and create these uh, endolithic environments and rocks that maybe weren't initially uh, habitable. Okay, and the final habitat. I'm not going to talk about crater lakes today. They're a bit more um, you know easy to um, perhaps envisage, um, but impact generated glasses. Uh, so these. Um, a and B here are just regular optical microscope images in plain polarized light. If you can't read it, that's a 50 micron scale bar. And on the right hand, right -hand side are a couple of uh, backscat, sorry, uh, these would be secondary electron images, I think, on a scanning electron microscope. If you look in here, you can see all of these little structures. Um, they're not uh, quench crystallites, which are quite common in volcanic and impact glasses. Um, and particularly when, you know, draw your attention to this bottom one, these uh, th things are typically curved and you can see they're segmented. And if you look uh, down in the bottom left, you can see, actually see that they spiral. So this is a series of stacked images. There's something like a hundred different images at different uh, Z levels here. And so you look, you're getting a bit of a three dimensional view. You can see they do really funky things like this um, that typically, you know, crystallites uh, don't typically do. Um, as it happens, you know, as a quick aside, one of those, you know, fun serendipitous things that happens in science. Uh, I was at a conference um, in uh, an early Mars conference uh, before I was at Western and before actually Neil Banerjee was at Western and uh, he showed an image of, um, let me get this right, uh, so the top here are these tubular structures in volcanic glass from the Ontong Java Plateau. And in the bottom, these are the images from actually the Reese Crater in Germany from these impact glasses. Uh, and actually, one, once Neil and I both ended up at Western, we had a PhD student, Haley Sapers, who worked on these and uh, published a paper in geology, then a couple of follow-up papers, proposing that these are essentially trace fossils. So you have organisms, again, endolithic organisms, that are burrowing into the grass, using that as an energy source. And you know what's left is not the organism, but a, a trace of uh, you know think of it almost as a worm burrow as uh, of, of what they left behind. So again, why is this important? Well, impact events occur you know in every object with a solid surface, uh, even in the tiniest craters you know down to a few tens of meters across, you will melt a certain proportion of that uh, target, 
and that usually gets quenched to form a glass. And so this is a habitat that could be created on Mars, you know, even at the present day, asteroids, uh, any particular object that you want to think about, and of course, early Earth. Okay, so in a, a few minutes now, just kind of switching gears um, to, um, you know, not the habitats, but the kind of the building blocks and the ingredients for life. Uh, so this is um, not really something that uh, I'm working on myself, um, but we've kind of brought this together in a review paper that I'll uh, highlight if you're interested in learning more at the end of the talk. You know, this is actually not something particularly new. Uh, Chris Chiber, Chiber and, uh, you know, the famous Carl Sagan in the early 90s kind of looked at what we have in the world's meteorite collections and suggested that asteroids and comets may have been responsible for the delivery of, you know, intact organic molecules and volatiles. Uh, the image here is a slice, I think about a centimeter or so across, maybe a bit more of the Murchison meteorite. So there's a, you know, a big, biggish class of meteorites that are the carbonaceous chondrites, and they're called carbonaceous because they're very carbon rich. Um, there are actually four kind of ways to deliver um, this carbon rich material to Earth. Um, you know, inter interplanetary dust particles that are falling on Earth, you know, every second of every day. Um, there's a lot of that is very carbon rich. Uh, an interesting phenomena called air bursts. So if you remember back to, oh, might get this wrong now, 2003, four, uh, the Chelyabinsk uh, um, explosion in Siberia. That's where we had a projectile a few tens of meters across that basically came through into the Earth's atmosphere and wasn't big enough to hit the ground and create a crater and essentially exploded in the Earth's atmosphere, creating an airburst. Those are actually better in a way than craters in disseminating and preserving material. And uh, because comets are fairly weak, there's a, an idea that a lot of you know, comets, even fairly big ones, come in and do you know, explode in the atmosphere. Uh, we also have, of course, cometary impacts, you know, so large kilometer size uh, comets hitting the Earth, and then, of course, meteorites. And, you know, there's been tons of studies, and it seems oh, like there's not a week goes by that there's not another neat new study. But the total now is, you know, it's above 80 amino acids that have been found in uh, meteorites, high, high amounts of, you know, the tronops, you know, so the six kind of life essential elements plus others a whole bunch of cool uh, molecules that have been implicated uh, in the origin of life. And I think what's important here is that, you know, there's been some neat modeling done and actually ex shock experiments, because you might think, well, in an impact event, you know, none of this stuff gets preserved. Um, even in an imp a large hypervelocity impact event, a proportion does survive. Uh, people have done shock experiments to show that, you know, this material can survive fairly high shock pressures. Um, and numerical models have been used to suggest that, you know, a certain percentage, it's small, but it's a certain percentage of, you know, comets as they come through the atmosphere will essentially be spalled off and, you know, just uh, settle down well away from the uh, target uh, impact point. Okay, another um, neat aspect where um, impacts may have played a role in the origin of life is in creating kind of the mineral substrates or the mineral ingredients for life. And so, you know, this is an interesting area of research too. Um, there's some, you know, important papers in the 2000s suggesting that minerals may have played um, a role in the formation of simple organic molecules and also kind of acting as templates um, for, you know, the formation of even RNA. Um, this is based on a lot of experimental work. Um, and montmorillonite is a clay that you'll often see implicated in this. And, and clays in general are an interesting group of minerals because, you know, they have kind of, well, this is one particular clay mineral, you know, very open structures. You can put all sorts of other, you can cram all sorts of other things into the, the clay structure. And again, because of the, these uh, kind of basal structures, um, the idea that they may have acted as templates uh, for life. Um, why is that important? Well, I talked about hydrothermal systems earlier, um, and it turns out, you know, clays are ubiquitous in impact craters. And if you ever do get a chance to go to the Reese crater, it's even more than that. So in the ejector blankets of craters, um, you know, going clays impacts can, of course, excavate pre-existing material. So that's kind of interesting, too, because, you know, in a total aside, as it pops into my head, you know, 
you have a big impact. Uh, it can excavate, you know, serpentinite and things from, from deeper down in the Earth's crust and put that on the surface of the Earth where it's very unstable. Um, in this case, if you go to this particular quarry at the Reeds Crater, there appear, there's essentially two layers of ejector. The reddish materials are clays that existed before the impact that were put onto the surface by the impact event. And then this greenish material here with this very sharp contact is the infamous suavite or impact melt bearing breccia. And this little, this is a thin section, I should have said, so, you know, two by three centimeters. This is what this material looks like in, in uh, close up. And actually not only does it contain clays, but it contains glass as well. You know, so it's a highly reactive substrate that was distributed 10, 20, 30 kilometers from the point of impact and is lying on the surface of, of this particular crater. And we think most craters, including on Mars as well. Okay, so I'll kind of start wrapping things up now and summarize and hopefully leave enough uh, time for questions at the end. So if we come back to this hypothesis, um, I want to kind of walk you through, uh, this is from a, this recent paper that we published, or this wasn't me, <laughs> I'm not that efficient in Photoshop, but work with a graphic artist to kind of think about craters from a geo geobiological perspective as opposed to purely a geological perspective. So this is kind of, you know, at time zero plus, you know, a few tens of years, thousands of years, perhaps, depending on how big the crater is. So we have, you know, a very inhospitable environment in the center of the crater. Um, but even here, you know, something I didn't present on, um, even rocks that were, you know, put in the middle of these lava flows as clasts, you know, we've done other work that's shown that the bioessential elements um, are still preserved. And even biosignatures can be preserved uh, in, in material in the center of the crater. So you have brecciated central uplift. So these are the rocks that are uplifted from depth, can contribute to the heat source for the hydrothermal systems. But we also have, you know, fracture networks coming through. Um, we create all of these early habitats. So porous rocks, and actually I think this is a picture of this uh, Canadian shield pumice that uh, I hinted at a while ago. You know, this material is distributed both in the crater interior and, you know, all around the outside. Um, we have impact melt flows and ponds forming, and then, you know, some regular ejector around the outside. Depending on how uh, much water is available, you know, the Reese Crater in Germany, this could have happened, I mean, even within days in theory, um, but definitely weeks, months, and years following the impact event. And depending on, you know, where your water table is, um, but the water table is, you know, significantly uh, disrupted as that starts to reestablish itself and you get precipitation, um, you'll get crater lakes forming. Um, so this provides, you know, that water so main water source and this particular example for the hydrothermal systems. Of course, if you had a marine impact, that would be like Chicxulub, that would be a main water source. And this is where, you know, the habitats and the uh, hydrothermal, the, um, the, the environments of life really get going. Uh, so we have hydrothermal mineralization, you know, we've shown here endolithic colonization of these shocked rocks kind of around the crater exterior. We might have some, um, you know, ponds and little lakes forming around the outside here. Um, steam vents and hot springs forming both out, you know, outside the crater and uh, inside. Um, I do want to highlight, and we touch on this again in this review paper that I'll uh, mention that is highlighted at the top. There's a few key environment, other environments where people have proposed life originated on Earth. And one of the things that we did in this paper is revisit them and say, well, you can actually create all of those environments in one impact event too. You know, if you're a proponent of subaerial hydrothermal vents as a setting for life, um, well, you, you can have those around an impact crater. And then we know from the Reese crater that we do have subaqueous hydrothermal vents. Uh, pumice has been talked about as a habitat for life, a kind of a neat habitat for life too. Uh, and that material would have been all around. And so to basically summarize, you know, if we come back to the, uh, the origin of life on Earth, um, this kind of snapshot of, uh, of life going back to 4.5, 6 or 7 billion years. Um, I have, this wasn't really the focus of this talk, um, but uh, impact cratering, you know, is a geological process that is common to all planetary objects in the solar system. And, you know, 
I don't think it's a big extrapolation to say the universe. You know, the way we understand solar systems to form, there's always going to be material left over. And I think that comets are also, you know, a, a something that is generated in most solar systems systems that we know of, or at least we've modeled. And so you're always going to have impact cratering occur uh, in any solar system. And the important thing too, is that it's independent of, of size of the object. So even small asteroid, asteroids, you know, take Vesta, um, it had volcanism very early on, but impact cratering could keep occurring to the present day. So impact events can generate, uh, sorry, deliver the chemical ingredients for life organics, and then create the conditions suitable for the emergence of life, both through providing the substrates and then these habitats that kind of, again, weren't there before the impact. And so, you know, we have this idea that, yes, you know, at ground zero, an impact event is initially destructive, um, <clears throat> but on early Earth, um, I would say, you know, the benefits uh, outweigh that, uh, uh, any negative aspects of impact events being formed. Um, if you are not bored of what I've said and uh, would like to learn more, um, it was just a month or so ago we had this uh, review paper published uh, with the same title as this talk uh, in the journal Astrobiology. And uh, if you just kind of Google this title, it should come up in Astrobiology too. And of course, you have this recorded if uh, you want to go through this and yeah, check out what we have to say in, uh, on this topic in a bit more detail. And so with that, I'll uh, leave you... Um, with uh, questions and I think I'll maybe stop sharing my screen so I can uh, see more of you uh, on my screen and uh, take questions either through chat or by video.